How do you prove that the Bible is really true? Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan, a scholar of the Bible and religion, increasing public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and combating the spread of misinformation about the same. Let's take a look at a video. So there are lots of lines of evidence which you would use to prove the veracity of Scripture. All right, let's see it. I would say one of them would be the person of Jesus Christ. The presentation of Christ in the Bible is beyond human invention. You remember that they said of Jesus, no man ever spoke like this man spoke. Mm -hmm. His words are just beyond all human philosophy. This is laughably false. There is nothing that is presented in the Gospels that does not have some kind of antecedent in earlier Jewish or Greek literature. How do you explain his resurrection with 500 eyewitnesses hmm. who didn't expect him to rise from the dead? So the evidence for this claim that a resurrected Jesus appeared to more than 500 people is limited to a single claim made by someone who was not an eyewitness to that appearance in 1 Corinthians 15. There are no data that indicate that claim is anything other than Paul passing on a claim that he once heard. Now, there are a lot of people who suggest, well, Paul wouldn't have made it up. Paul wouldn't have passed on something he didn't know to be true uh, because somebody in the audience could have been an eyewitness, could have corrected him. This is also not supported by any data. Paul is writing to a congregation that he himself started in Corinth. There is not a single person ever mentioned in Corinth who was an eyewitness to any of this. Paul is closer to these events than everyone to whom he is writing. And so, no, that is not an argument. There's no evidence anyone there could have corrected him. Additionally, there's no evidence that Paul verifies every last thing that he says. And even if he did, that verification here could have only been limited to talking to people who claim to have been there. And so we are several steps away from having anything remotely approximating valid evidence that this ever happened. How do you expect apostles who thought he was dead and were running to hide all of a sudden becoming world-changing zealot evangelists? The only explanation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The birth of the church comes out of that. In addition to the fact that the characterization of the apostles as running like squirrels after Jesus' execution is based on literary creations coming decades after the fact, the only explanation is not the resurrection of Jesus. The best explanation is a conviction of the resurrection of Jesus, which does not require eyewitness testimony. Throughout history, people have changed their lives in every generation because they became convicted of something that they did not personally witness. There are better explanations for this, and there are decades and decades of research in the fields of social memory and the cognitive science of religion that show us that the notion, the only explanation, or even the best explanation, is that this actually happened is not supported by any data. And if you would like one, I think, great discussion of how these memories become distorted through time, Bart Ehrman's book, Jesus Before the Gospels, is wonderful. So how do you explain the Old Testament giving 350 prophecies of Jesus Christ, half of them coming true historically and recorded so in the New Testament, the other half are going to come true at his second coming? So two concerns here. First, there are zero prophecies about Jesus Christ in the Hebrew Bible. But for someone who really wants there to be, it's not difficult to reinterpret it so that it sounds like there are. Second concern, when you're writing stories about Jesus Christ decades after his death, and you need to make it sound like Jesus is fulfilling prophecies from the Hebrew Bible, it's easy to do that. Another one you would use is science. When people are saying the world is flat, the Bible says that the earth is a sphere. The Bible says absolutely no such thing whatsoever. This is another presuppositional reinterpretation. Uh, Isaiah 40:22 begins by referring to God as Hayoshev al Chug Haaretz, which means uh, the one who sits enthroned upon the circle of the earth, which refers to the traditional Israelite conceptualization of the earth as a flat disk surrounded by water enclosed within a solid dome that is the skies. So no, this has absolutely nothing to do with a spherical conceptualization of the earth. That is a much later reinterpretation that follows after science, does not precede it. When people were saying that the, the world was floating in space, 
The Bible says it turns on an axis like clay to the seal. It rotates on its own axis. This is a flagrant misreading of Job 38.14, which uses the Hepile stem of the verbal root hafach to refer to the earth taking shape like clay under a seal. And this is actually a reference to the breaking dawn, how the features and contours of the earth are revealed as the light spreads across it, just like Clay has features imposed upon it by a seal being rolled over it. So the earth is not the thing that is turning. The earth is the thing that is being changed by the turning of the seal. This is laughably incorrect. Uh, the Bible says the stars can't be numbered in a day when scientists had counted a 1,023 of them. So this one really baffled me. I have never heard this claim. I could not find any such claim anywhere. It's a nonsensical claim anyway. The closest I can come to an explanation is that this person uh, misread or saw a misreading of the very common estimate that there are 10 to the 23rd power stars in the observable universe. Uh, if that's the case, Wow. Um, if that's not the case, I have no idea where this claim is coming from. You look at archaeology, and you can compare the history of the, of the scripture with what archaeology has discovered. You'll find precise conformity to those facts. So this is simply false, and scholars have not believed this was true since the 19th century. Uh, what we see as we gather more and more archaeological data is that the stories in the Bible from around the 9th century BCE and before are largely legendary and inaccurate. They do not conform to the data. From around the 9th century BCE and after, the broad outline of the historical narrative, the backdrop, the setting for the stories in the Bible is more or less accurate, but many of the details of the stories, the characters and what's going on on center stage are less accurate. So it's a mixed bag. Uh, generally, the later we get, the more and more um, conforming to the historical data the stories are, but not so much in many of the details that are at the center of the stories. And one other one, and I would say it's the defense of experience. The Word of God does what it says it will do. It transforms lives. Well, so do the Quran and the Book of Mormon.